Project Binky in Colour. Starring Nick Blackhurst. Also starring Richard Brunning. And Rex Hamilton as Abraham Lincoln. Tonight's episode, Come Grind Yourself. Coming up in episode 25, Nick makes an awful lot of noise while I try to concentrate on the wiring. For f***'s sake! And with the arrival of the Great British Summer, we both take some time out for a leisurely drive in the country. No, this is a road, not a river. Uh, it was a road. It was a road yesterday. Yeah, but we're already up to the bottom of the door. Okay. <laughs> Yay! Good work, fella. At the end of the previous episode, we turned a Vauxhall Corsa radiator into a charge cooler heat exchanger. We'd made a damn good start on planning the complex task of installing the ECU, and modified a Toyota Igo AC condenser to fit the infinitesimally small space left at the front of the Mini. And while you were away, we cut up some expensive hose, added the aluminium AN fittings and finished off the lines that connect the AC system together. So short of charging it up with some gas, that's another job checked off the list. Yeah, we're at that stage where we've just got a few little jobs to finish off before we can call it done. Nothing very exciting I'm afraid, but these are the sort of jobs that make the difference between a nice looking show car and a vehicle you can actually use. So in no particular order, we're going to start with the clutch actuation. Well. Surely that's as easy as bolting the slave cylinder on? Uh, well, yes, it would be, only it doesn't fit anymore. Well, that's just great. Now, to be fair, we've known this since I put the radiator in, and I wasn't really worried about it because the plan was always to use the concentric release bearing down in the bell housing. The problem with that is we can't actually find anyone that makes one and after going through all of the universal ones we can find, nothing actually fits in there. So I'm afraid we're stuck with the original slave cylinder. So I did what any truly smart person would have done and made it somebody else's problem. We called our friends at Competition Supplies and they sent us this. Brilliant. And this bit. And not forgetting this. That'll sort it. The plan here is to remove the bleed nipple to a new special banjo bolt on the feed line. Remove the boss where the original nipple resided and weld up the hole. That should give us enough clearance to the radiator. The grinder takes care of whipping off the boss. And the TIG welder is deployed to plug up the hole. Smoking. Our trusty finger sander then finishes off the modification before a thorough clean out and reassembly. A coat of primer and a lick of black paint complete the job. Nice. The new slimline clutch slave cylinder can now go back on the gearbox. Now it's time to sort out the hydraulic hose, starting with changing this plastic clamp for one with three holes in it. Yeah, just like that one. We need something to secure the hose to the gearbox, so Nick is making his own P-clip stand, and most of a P-clip.
Well, that's neat and tidy. It should now fit with the radiator back on. And by Jove, it does. Like that. That should bleed up okay with a vacuum bleeder, and if it doesn't, all we need to do is remove it and lift the thing up above the level of the reservoir. So I'm calling that job done, and it's time to move on to the next one, which is wiring in the alternator. And for that, we need the front on, do we? It won't have escaped your attention that we've gone and hidden the battery under the passenger seat where we can't get at it. So, while we're sorting out this heavy-duty wiring down here, we're going to take the opportunity to put in a battery jump post like this one. Yes, the front end is going to get in the way, but it's on because this wing is just one of the things we need to avoid while sighting this. As well as the air intake, this bonnet hinge, the reservoir for the charge cooler heat exchanger, a catch can that might go here, and a strut brace if we can fit one in. So, not as straightforward as it would seem. Things are really simple when Nick is involved. Well, apart from posing the question, shall I put the kettle on, where the answer is invariably in the affirmative, he likes to take a contrary position on pretty much everything. The amount of times the goalposts have been moved on this project is just astonishing. Sometimes they don't get moved, they get ripped out, disassembled, put on a trailer, driven down the lane, across the border into Wales, and re-erected in a different country as rugby posts. Still, he's in his happy place right now, making a bracket. And quite a handsome bracket it is too. 3mm steel used for this one for some extra rigidity, as the jump post box is sitting right on top and we don't want the bracket fracturing through vibration. The M8 fasteners might seem excessive, but that's what's already on the car that we're fixing to. With the jump post mounted in what we hope is a suitable position, now we've got something to aim the wiring at. We whipped out the hydraulic crimpers, heat shrink and hot air gun to make a couple of high capacity cables. Hmm. And true to form, Nick has decided to repurpose the jump post into something more suitable for our needs with the addition of a small adapter plate. You'll see what all this is about in a moment. 10 points by the way, if you noticed we splashed out on some new TIG gauntlets. If you're still none the wiser, after all that, our battery jump post has now become a mini battery distribution box as well. What we've ended up with then is the output from the alternator connected directly to the jump post, which is then connected to the starter motor, which then goes all the way back to the battery positive. The power steering pump needs a fairly hefty supply, but it didn't make any sense running a big wire back through the chassis rail all the way to the fuse box. So that's been taken care of off the battery post via this fuse here, and then fed by this red wire, which comes down to here. And technically, at least, this should now work. Yes, it is supposed to do that. It's a very clever pump. I'm here back at the fuse box trying to work out a way of integrating our standalone ECU with the MG's power distribution board. Now, you really wouldn't do it this way normally, but unfortunately we are because, you know, Nick. No, what you do ordinarily is build your own fuse and relay box to ensure that you have all the bits you need and none that you don't. However, all those wires, fuses and relays already exist in this assembly so there's really no excuse not to use it. So the job is integrating this lot into the standard manufacturer loom, which is a bit of a nightmare. But, like with all the other systems, we'll take it one wire at a time. Starting with power to the ECU. We start by plugging in the A loom. This has the main power feed wire, which according to our pinout is red. We're temporarily hooking this up to our wiring with the use of a chocky block. I've whacked on a ring terminal to the ground wires from the ECU and this is bolted down to our fuse box frame. Now I can turn on the isolator and then switch the ignition on to see what happens. The blue flashing LED is a very good sign. That's great, we've got power to the ECU and I'm not on fire. 
So now we need to get an ignition live to all the components that the ECU controls. And on the MG, that's taken care of by this socket here. Time for a quick test. On. None. Hmm. Bear with. So it turns out that these ignition lives are not actually controlled by the ignition switch at all. Nope, they're controlled by the MG engine ECU, which sends a ground signal down this wire to this relay. <clears throat> so now all I've got to do is get our link ECU to do what the MG ECU did. After pretty much completing my ECU wiring spreadsheet, I've got one spare auxiliary out which we'll use to switch the ignition relay. Only it wasn't as simple as that. You see, our eight auxiliary outputs from the ECU are very clever. They can handle all sorts of different functions including high frequency PWM. And that flexibility turned out to be a problem for us. When the key is turned off and the power is cut to the ECU, all those auxiliary outs switch to ground, which is exactly the condition needed to fire the relay that powers all those ignition lives. So they stayed live even with the key out and the doors locked. So instead of a normal auxiliary output, I need to use an unused ignition or coil drive, which does just break the circuit when the key is turned off. Thankfully, I have two to choose from. Sadly, they're both on the second loom. Brilliant. More wires. I've configured the output in the PC Link software and I'm connecting the associated wire up to our existing loom, temporarily. But to test it, I need to connect the ECU to the laptop and upload the new config file. With that done, let's give it a try. Oh yeah. Well, that was good. So while we're on a roll, we're going to hook up the fuel pump relay and try that. The fuel pump is currently the only component controlled by the ECU that is actually wired in and ready to go. What should happen is that we turn the key, the ignition comes on, and I've set the pump to prime for two seconds and then shut off. Try it. Yeah. Well, that worked. Now all I've got to do is every other wire. No. All of them. It's all very well and good getting all that wiring ready to come through into the engine bay, but we can't actually get it there at the moment. What we need is a hole in the bulkhead. And the only place we've got left to try and put one big enough is somewhere down here. This looks like a suitable place for a fairly big hole. Apart from the fact there is really nowhere else to put one. We're going to replicate this bulkhead pass-through from the Celica because and I know all you grommet watchers will be happy about this, we're using the standard Toyota loom bellows, which is sturdy, reliable, and has an integral mounting plate. How'd you like them apples? Before the bulkhead is hacked about, a mounting plate is needed. Well, that's lovely. Now I've got something to pass the wiring harness through into the engine bay. But right now I've got nothing to wire to, so let's fix that starting with mounting the four port boost control solenoid and the map sensor. Both of these are going to live on the bulkhead, so they'll need a bracket. This one will be dual use and mount both components, so 
After some measuring and marking out, the grinder cuts out the basic shape before moving on to the pillar drill for some holes. Those little holes are then tapped to M3. M3! Who designs these things? The finishing touch is then applied by the hammer. So there's the bracket. All we need now is something on the bulkhead to attach it to. A plate with a brace of studs sticking out is just what the doctor ordered. Now the bracket along with the map sensor and boost control solenoid can get bolted to the bulkhead. The last thing we want to do after the shell is painted is to be grinding paint and welding anything else to the car. So this full fit up or dry build is essential to make sure we don't omit something by accident and then have to ruin a nice paint job. There, that looks good. Happy to have something to wire up in the engine bay too. Excellent. Now, one or two of you have been banging on about how long this project is taking, and it's likely that fossil fuels will have run out by the time we've got it on the road. Not only is that kind of remark side-splittingly funny, it's also quite probably fairly accurate. So, we've taken steps to mitigate that eventuality by adding in a flex fuel sensor that will allow us to run it on eco-friendly bioethanol. Any perceived performance benefits will be purely coincidental. While we were down in that area, it seemed like a good opportunity to terminate the fuel system hard lines. The flex fuel sensor is plumbed into the return line, so that's the first one to be finished off with some aluminium dash 6 AN fittings. The larger dash 8 feed line needed an addition to the bracket, but that's now all in two. Time for a well-earned cup of tea, I reckon. And a couple of chocolate hobnobs. Back to the important stuff, and it looks like things have got a lot worse in here. But actually, I've managed to finish the integration of our new ECU into the original MG Loom. We've stuck with it thus far, so we've decided to retain all of the functions of the standard MG power distribution board. So that means all of the fuses, relays and circuits are doing the job they were originally designed for. And I've resolved the interface between the OEM wiring and our new Link ECU wiring with this one plug. This connects the ignition lives to the coils and the injectors and also carries power to the ECU, along with switching for the rad fan and the fuel pump, because that's all we need. This second plug contains feeds to other stuff that someone has since decided need controlling by the ECU. This includes, but is probably not limited to, the AC, the power steering pump and the charge cooler pump. It's all in, but before I can call it done, I've got to configure the ECU and test it all. Once you get your head around it, the configuration of the various outputs isn't too bad and the help files in the Link software are very detailed. We'll try the power steering pump first, and I will set this to come on when the engine is running, but for now, it's on with the key. Well, that's a good start. What about the charge cooler pump? Yep, pretty happy with that, so the rad fan is next. If you're wondering if that little fan can shift enough air... All very well, you say, but what about all three radiators? Oh yeah, she could suck starter, Harley. We can't really test the AC, but you can see here that when this wire gets a signal from the switch, the ECU is configured to turn the AC compressor on. Well, that's tickety-boo. I suppose there's nothing else for it but to tidy up. I'm guessing no one wants to see Rich do any more wiring, so we'll cut back to the front here, and the next small job on my list, which is to sort out some wiring. Boring, I know, but if I can sort out this mess, then that's all of the chassis wiring on the car sorted. Now, it should be a simple case of just knock up a couple of quick brackets to support a washer bottle on the horns around here, but, as usual, we've got naff all space, so I'm guessing things are about to get a lot more funkin' complicated.
He's done it to me again, longing out the job so I can't fit the montage in one song. Typical. Oh well, here's another tune. This one's called Bad Chipmans. Not off. <laughs> So there you have it, one custom made washer bottle with integral horn mounts. Using all the available space, this also acts as part of the inner wing or splash guard and has a water capacity of just a tick under 2.5 litres or about 85 US fluid ounces or 4.4 pints, however you're measuring it. It started out relatively simply, but it'll come as no surprise that things quickly got out of hand and it ended up far more complicated than originally thought. Before the bolts get talked up, we better make sure it's level. Make the noise. The washer bottle has its own swirl pot type thing for the pumps to mount into. So the rubber grommets go in before the pumps are pushed into place. The pumps are secured properly to the bottle by this little clamp. Very neat. And the last job here is to connect up the wiring. Colour coded plugs you'll notice, so even Nick can't get them the wrong way round. Now we can screw the horns on. And connect those up too. And that's the last of the chassis wiring in place. Which is nice. I hope you'll agree that that isn't a bad looking unit. A lot of thought, time and tea went into it. And if Nick's got his calculations right, the front should shut down with nothing fouling. And it does. Brilliant. The finishing touch is brought to you via a Ford Sierra washer bottle cap for that 80s OEM look. While Nick was dicking about with his bottle, I've been pushing numerous wires through the bulkhead. That's quite a lot of wires, but the end result was worth it because now the interior is tidy. I'm pretty happy with that, however there's still much wiring to do, but for now we'll leave it there for this episode. Thanks for watching. Tune in 
next time for another exciting episode from the files of Project Binky. You didn't think we wouldn't test it, did you? And the horns, obviously.